Have you ever considered the lengths some artists go to to create a work of art? All the stuff that happens beyond the frame is the wacky adventure of me buying this drum kit from these Mexican punks, chucking it in the back of the car, driving out to the desert, like, who am I? <laughs> Welcome to Conversations from the Collection, a Newcastle Art Gallery podcast. I'm your host, Zana Kobayashi, and this week we meet with Tina Havelock Stevens in Sydney on the lands of the Gadigal people, where she is currently undertaking a prestigious year long studio residency in the recently refurbished Art Space building. How long have you been here? Uh, a week. There you have a look out the window. Check everybody out eating their pies. Yeah, I think I'll be making some pretty interesting things in here. Yeah. Fusing her experience as a documentary filmmaker and post-punk drummer, Tina has established herself as a leading figure in contemporary Australian video and performance art. Tina's artistic practice has seen her travel across the world to create video works that feature her drumming within monumental and historically charged sites. She has played her drum kit on an abandoned industrial site in Detroit, in the vast landscapes of the West Texan desert, fully submerged in the Derwent River in Hobart, and even on Newcastle's very own breakwater, the resulting work now within Newcastle Art Gallery's collection. We begin our conversation by talking about Tina's shift from punk rocker to visual artist and the reasons behind her change in focus. Um, I always sort of talk about it in terms of uh, coming out as an artist about 12 years ago. Yeah. So basically putting everything that I do and turning it into a visual art practice, which kind of suited me better. So I was always in kind of artistic fields like music, filmmaking, a bit of television. But your artistic expression is still sort of, what's the word? I don't want to say crushed, but I had been crushed. Yeah, yeah. Um, because, you know, there's particular agendas and ways that you do things and mm. stuff like that. So I guess becoming a visual artist or a multidisciplinary artist really is a freeing of myself. Yeah. And so my spirit started to live. Love that. Been more in my skin. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I was always kind of, you know, I'd make a documentary and it would be for SBS or something like that. And then the commissioning editor would go, oh, you've got to cut that bit out. And it was some really important bit or make me do like a bit of voiceover that I knew wasn't right for the subject. And I'd get very attached to my subjects and wanted to represent them truthfully. And yeah, the whole sort of ethical thing got a bit, bit weird for me, so. Do you think that's like the commercial layer that comes over a lot of those like filmmaking, music, there's sort of a yeah. commercial. Well, it's kind of the thing, isn't it? It's like, okay, yeah. well, if you're gonna get money from a film funding area mm. or through television, then you're gonna have to, you know, you're gonna have to make that documentary 52 minutes long. You can't make it 62 and a half, which is kind of where one of my docos just sat really nicely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've got to, there's all these things that you have to do. And there was too many rules for an old post-punker like me. You know, I was doing it and working yeah. hard, but, you know, it probably wasn't the most lucrative decision, but... Um, <laughs> but you're soul singing. So. But, but soul singing and, you know, I'm picking up a bit of public art now so I can actually yeah. live. Amazing. Yeah. I actually wanted to touch on your post-punk era because yeah. you spent your sort of formative years um, playing DIY music and you drummed in bands such as the Plug Uglies, yeah. Crow, the Titanic, and you played alongside other bands such as like Sonic Youth yeah. and Pavement. Yeah. What was this time in your life like? Oh, it's a long time ago now. <laughs> it's, everything's completely changed. I mean, it's not, not within me, you know, I'm the same person, but I'm existing in a, a very different world now i suppose this was all pre-internet a lot of it yeah you made your friends through the type of shoes they wore or the album collection yeah it's like oh you're my sort of person you've got an album by Sonic Youth and by suicide you know like <laughs> it was all that kind of stuff and i was very much an inner city person in sydney mm. that doesn't exist anymore that's a ge geographic term now whereas back then an inner city person like if you stepped outside 
of Surrey Hills or Darlinghurst or Newtown seemed a long way away back then. Um, <laughs> you were kind of, people would just go you for your, your purple hair or your, you know, what you're wearing. Yeah. I did, I did have aubergine hair for a little while, but you know. Fail. Um, yeah, <laughs> got to go through it. Um, but also this place too, which I haven't really gone into. Like I used to hang out at this place when I was really young, when it was called the Gunnery and it mm. was a squat. And my band Plug Uglies played in this building. No way. Yeah. Oh, wow. It would have been like the late 80s or something. Yeah. Oh, so this is a bit of a full circle moment. Yeah, but I, I sort of don't really talk about it, but it's yeah. kind of, yeah, I have sort of seen it through various things. And then I remember doing a drumming performance here in 1997 as well. So it's kind of crazy that I'm here. Mm. Some people were quite, you know, a lot of the squatters and the artists that lived here were all kind of furious when it got overtaken by art space and everything. But look, it's a wonderful space. We just, I'm glad it's still related to the arts, really. Yeah. It could have gone anyway. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've heard you say that you didn't feel like it was particularly remarkable to be a female drummer until you started clocking other, other people's people. reactions to you. Yeah. And what, what were the reactions like at that time? Ugh. Yeah, just well everyone called me, a lot of guys would call me Maureen Tucker. They'd go Maureen Tucker, Maureen Tucker, because she was the drummer of the Velvet Underground. Right. So there was a, a, a reference there. Yeah. Otherwise I'd have guys come up going, oh you know there's a, I saw a band the other night and there was a woman drumming and she was really good. So sort of setting up kind of like a competition, like mm. there can only ever be one. <laughs> it went from just like people trying to drag me away you know, and nearly, a bunch of bikies in Geelong nearly made off with me, but the band kind of had to rescue me. No way. <laughs> they liked oh. me, but hey. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was just doing my thing, but people were looking at me in a particular way. Now I know that um, some people have come up and said, oh, you were such an inspiration, which I never, I didn't see any of that. I didn't see my inspiration. I didn't see that I was any different. I was just doing my thing. And you got used to kind of, it being that way. Mm. Guys would say it and you go, oh yeah, there's that comment, you know, whatever. Mm. Keep, keep going. Get on with Yeah, so it was just sort of all part of it really. Yeah. It was very strange. When I think back to it now, I think of opportunities that I missed out on because of that. Yeah. Yeah, because people were, you know, probably scared to uh, approach me as well. Um, all of that stuff is kind of a bit annoying. It's kind of interesting to think about how much it's changed as well. Like I've been talking to yeah. a lot of female artists and yeah. you know, across many generations and the just that radical shift, you know, that people are experiencing within their lifetimes. Yeah. It's you know, we're not all the way there yet. No. It's not really because there's still a thing about girl drummers, like it's still special somehow. And it's been kind of commodified and I mean there's like people like what G Flip or whatever her name is yeah. and things like that. It's commodified into a really, you know, big money making venture. You know. I know someone said to me the other day, God, you've been around doing this stuff and now there's G Flip. I'm like, oh well. <laughs> <laughs> Drumming and performing are also integral parts to your art practice. And I was wondering how the two disciplines bring out different things in your drumming. Like, what are you able to explore in drumming within your art making practice as opposed to drumming within a band? Yeah. So, the drumming in a band, it just wasn't very relaxing. You know, I get a bit anxious and, you know, I love a good song, but drumming for me, having to start, stop, I like the fact that I can improvise. Mm. I love it. And I always thought that everybody could improvise and that maybe meant that I wasn't such a good drummer. And then someone said, no, you got it around the wrong way. Like actually improvising is a great thing. I was like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess I, oh, look, it's sort of a search for, I've got to find a better word than kind of freedom. But I mean, the thing with improvisation is that you are reacting to real time right then and there. Mm. Okay, and I really like that aspect. I love it. I don't know what I'm going to play and whether I'm with a dancer or with musicians or um, doing site specific drumming, which of course is what, you know, it's become using the drum kit and my playing as a conduit for a space or to create a soundtrack at that moment in time and place. Yeah. That's where it's all gone. So, yeah, it was kind of funny. Like I just sort of started drumming in galleries and then realised I could just drum forever. <laughs> Didn't want to stop. And <laughs> friends, when I first did it, were like, what are you, gee whiz. 
<laughs> and then that was it. Then yeah. I just started going for it. And, yeah. and I mean, the drumming underwater thing that I did. Oh, yeah, I'd love to yeah, talk about that. Yeah, you know, that was probably a more, I think people sort of start to think, oh, you're an extreme drummer and now you're going to drum from a parachute. And it wasn't really about all of that. It's about kind of reading the river. Mm. You know, also pushing myself, being a woman of a certain age and pushing it. Mm. But, yeah, it's also kind of a read of, of, of the actual kind of river and creates a soundtrack of it. And so just for our listeners at home, you were lowered, lowered into yeah. the river. Yeah. And you had a scuba yep. suit on yep. and, and breathing apparatus. And yep. then you drummed in the river. Yeah, for about 10 minutes. So wild. Yeah, it is wild. Like, I couldn't do it again. Like, I think about it and I'm just like, what? You know, it's funny when you look back at old work and you're like, whoa, you know. What did you but, find pushing yourself that physically? Oh, and could you still, you know, like, I've, what did you it? feel like you were still drumming? Like, Yeah, I kind of relaxed underwater. I just wanted to get away from everyone because yeah. I was hovering around up, up top. There's about 8,000 people there. <laughs> you know, that's all. <laughs> and um, a bunch of speakers going down the uh, pier. So, I mean, the thing is where I did it was in, it's just kind of at, uh, I can't remember, it's like near Salamanca in mm. Hobart. So it's Derwent River, but it's more like a harbour, really. Yeah. And the water's not very clear. That water's a bit dirty in that river. But yeah, so I got sort of taken out and I just played really fast across the water as I got taken out. And then as I plunged down, then I kind of slowed down. Actually. Yeah. And then I was just there and it was really kind of relaxing. I wasn't trying to be clever. I was just playing and tapping things and just hanging out in the water, you know. I'm a Pisces, I like water. <laughs> and um, I think that was the thing. It was just like, just play. And then about halfway through, I was like, geez, I wonder how much longer I've got, you know. <laughs> so we kind of agreed that I'd be down there, I think, for about 10 minutes and then they just pull me up. So then I just started moving up at some point. Oh, amazing. And then I got above the water and everyone just cheered and it's just, it was crazy and wild. And the first person I saw was my mum. So it was like a bit of a rebirth. Like I didn't even know where she was standing in the crowd and just saw her. So it was just like this kind of, yeah, nuts thing. But then the, the soundtrack that came out of it, like that playing of the river. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting because it's, it's just very simple, mm. you know, really simple. I yeah. also wondered if, um, I mean, obviously that performance did have an audience, but you know, your video works where you're out in like big, vast landscapes. Yeah. If there was a, a freedom that came from not drumming to an immediate audience. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And you were just talking about how drumming in a yeah. band, it was like a bit anxiety inducing yeah. and there's a lot of energy exchange that happens when you're playing in a band in front of a big crowd. Yeah, and there's lights and crowd and yeah. yeah. There is people. a freedom that comes from it's just you. Yeah, look, I've always loved playing outside. Yeah. I like the sound of it too. You know, you get like you hit that kick drum and it bounces off some rock or object or tree or building um, and you can hear the note kind of stretching. Um, I've always loved that. So there is something about being outside, you know, because I have drummed at some pretty extraordinary places and a lot, um, you know, travelling around the southwestern states of the USA. I drummed a giant rock, which was considered a spiritual vortex. Mm. And I was just, the, the guy that was filming me was like a, I mean, he didn't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just look. I just meet you in the car park, and then he actually <laughs> took me to the rock. Like I just said, I wanted to play in the desert, but he was a friend of a friend, and she said, "Just why don't you get him to shoot you?" He, you know, he goes out and he shoots the stars. You know, he's right into his astronomy, and I was like, "Okay, sure." Looked at some of his photos, thought if I can shoot the moon, he can shoot me. You know, mm. and um, he said, "So what are you going to do?" And I said, "Okay, so I'm just putting the drums here." He took me out to the rock. I was like, "Oh my god, thanks for bringing me here." And then I just started playing and yeah, I played for hours. At one point he was like, um, oh, I've got a drone in the back of the car. Cause I had just thought of it as a locked off shot. And he said, I've got a drone in the back of the car. I said, oh yeah, give it a go. Like, and that's the footage I ended up cutting and making the video out of, which yeah. won the bloody Blake prize. So, yes. you know, it's, it's kind of funny how these things go, but that all the stuff around these videos, I just want to say this, all the stuff that happens beyond the frame is the wacky, adventure of me buying this drum kit from these Mexican punks, chucking it in the back of the car, 
driving out to the desert. Like, who am I? Oh my God. I didn't even think about that. I didn't who even think I? about like, where did you get the drum yeah. kit from? <laughs> and then I go out there and then I find this guy, you know, and you know, I set it up. He's like, what are you doing? I'm saying, just, just shoot whatever you do. Don't, don't stop, you know, recording. <laughs> and um, we just kept playing and then it got dark and he was just sort of wandering around setting up shots and these people kind of turned up mm. and they're like hey don't we thought you were a dude <laughs> 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 oh dude what are you doing this is mad i'm like oh, i'm just like an artist you're not like an artist you are an artist <laughs> so it's just like oh my god anyway i ended up giving them like a private concert yes the four of them sat on a rock it was Two guys and two girls, they sat on a rock and I didn't record that. Yeah. So I just, and it was fantastic. And I remember that. And the only people that know about that is who was there, you know, that's and that's, so that's kind of nice stuff. And so everything kind of spills out and goes beyond, Yes. you know, yeah. but then you end up with this kind of little video that's, you know, the piece, I guess. That you win the Blake Prize with. Yeah, which, you know, I really got back to Sydney and kind of was like, oh, yeah, that drone footage, oh, yeah, I'll have a look at that. And then I was like, oh, yeah, and then I just cut it on the kitchen table and I went, oh, hang on a second, maybe this is okay, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd love to talk about your work in the Newcastle Art Gallery collection. It's a video work titled The Breakwater, which you created in 2018, and it's also shot from above via drone and it shows you drumming at the end of the break wall off Nobby's head in Newcastle. And it also features the voice of local historian Anne Hardy. I was wondering if you could talk to us about the development of this work. Okay, well, I guess um, I'd exhibited at the lockup a couple of years earlier. And so I'd met uh, Courtney Novak and they were having this show called uh, Hunter Red Seeing Red which was, yeah, about protest and activism. And so they thought it would be cool if I went and drummed out on the breakwater. And so I was like, oh, what's, what's all this about? So I started to kind of uh, delve into it. And it was like, oh, oh, this could be, could be really something. And so I thought, oh, it would be good with a drone because I'm going to be out near the water. And uh, so I got a local guy called Jack O'Toole and my practice really too, I should say, is, you know, it's informed by years of being a documentary maker, mm. you know, and having a documentary mind, you know, I'm an inquisitive person. I like to take the temperature of moods and modes and things like that. And I'm interested in the sort of psyche and the feeling of, of what's going on. And also kind of generations having their own body of knowledge and how they interact with the world, I suppose. Yeah, so basically I thought, okay, well, I'll go and interview someone who knows about this. So um, got in contact with Anne Hardy and took her down to the actual breakwater. I think it was a bit windy, so we were kind of huddled behind a rock <laughs> um, and did an interview with her about, yeah. about it all. I don't know, we probably talked for about half an hour and then I got it and chopped bits up, and placed it as an experimental voiceover into the into the piece, yeah. And um, it sounded pretty incredible. I mean, so this is, you know, we're talking the 1850s. Yeah, and it was the first site of protest in settler Australia, is that right? Well, apparently. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how you actually really gauge that, but mm. apparently. Yeah, so people got very upset because they wanted to get rid of the headland, which the breakwater's attached to as an attempt to improve the wind conditions for the tall ships entering the harbour. Anyway, the community got really upset about it and were writing kind of passionate poems to the local paper. And yeah, it was a really serious kind of activist moment and it mm. worked, mm, yeah. it worked. So the headland's still there. Maybe that's, um, we should go back to poetry in the newspaper. Maybe that's, what maybe that's it, <laughs> maybe that's it. But yeah, so it's, it's kind of wild. So anyway, so I just talked to her and then I, I suppose I treated it, it is like an experimental documentary, but there's always a, a, a story behind it. And that's my documentary head, mm. which kind of can, you know, layer upon layer things. But I still like a, an open interpretation. Like if you just see it as me drumming, that's fine. But sometimes it's nice to actually delve into the story and know that it's thick with layers, yeah. You're often attracted to quite historically charged yeah. places yeah. yeah and i know I that it. you go about selecting spaces like that to drum in and then 
using your drumming as a way to connect in between the intimate and the monumental, the intimate and the historical. Yeah, yeah it is about, you know, I do have this sort of, whether you call it an investigation or whatever, but it's, it's themes of survival and fragility, I guess, in yes. a way. Yeah. Um, and a loaded, very much a loaded environmental and emotional space too, I guess. Mm. Do you feel that you are, like, are you considering those things as you're playing? No. no. I know what got me there. Yeah. And then I just play. And then it's just about the wind and the seawater and the, and then people were sort of coming and checking me out. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's some nice moments in the in that work, the breakwater of yeah. people coming and yeah. you know, walking around you and looking. Yeah. And, yeah, and I really like that too. I kind of like the fact that, you know, even when I was drumming out the giant rock, like when I got the footage back, there was kids in the background dancing, which I, I didn't even know they were there. I was in the middle of the desert. Hmm. So it always has this, you know, you start drumming and it just the, the call, you know, people kind of turn up, <laughs> walk towards you. Oh. I don't know, it's, it's me making documentaries in a very experimental way. Experimental is like another elastic term that gets applied to a lot of things, but it's very experimental in the way that the drum kit is what is kind of signifying that something's going on or has gone on. Yeah. yeah. The breakwater has a few characteristics that run throughout your video works, looking at that sort of the tension between intimate, monumental, human, environment, emotion. Sublime. Sublime. Love that word. <laughs> uh, and you're often looking at those historically loaded sites, but pairing that with sort of private emotional spaces. Mm. I was wondering what it was that, that attracts you to these really vast monumental spaces like the West Texan desert or the airplane graveyard that you used for ghost class mm. uh, or those giant deserted industrial sites that you used in Detroit? I think there's something about the lack of control with them. We can't control, like, we can't control nature. I mean, try, but it's ridiculous. Mm. And I mean, these are things that exist. They're just there. You know, I'm sort of drawing attention to things that are just there. Um, and to some people they're probably very strange things you know it's a strange you know because I do a lot of work kind of looking at the belief systems that people have and sort of you know what someone believes here is antithesis for somebody else and it's all kind of nuts so I guess you know there's a a, a punkiness to me that's always kind of uh, loved an abandoned space yeah there's something about being in a place that's had something happened to it in terms of it, you know, like Detroit, for example, just felt like total sort of apocalyptic landscape or, yeah, it, it's like a big feelings place, you know. They're all, all places that you can sort of go and stand there and look out and just be there for 10 minutes and go, oh, you know, you, you couldn't not feel something mm. from them. Um, and it's sort of like a contrasting space to where you would normally see a p musical performance. Absolutely, well, it's like, know. like yeah, putting putting a drum kit where it shouldn't be. Yeah, putting an older woman where she shouldn't be. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all of it is just kind of wrong behaviour to what's supposed to happen. Yeah. Um, but then there's also the kind of the making the soundtrack of it too, like the playing the place and and whatever is in the area affecting it in an audio way, like when I played in the Packard building, which was like an old motor factory in Detroit, the sound there was so exciting. Mm. It's just like boom, with a kick and it would go boom, hit this wall <laughs> and come back at me like it felt like a couple of, you know, minutes later, although it was only <laughs> seconds. Yeah, I don't know, it, it's kind of a tricky question because it's sort of, you know, sometimes I don't think I think about things I kind of do without kind of analysing it too much. It's only afterwards I might go, oh, I'll write, I'll write a story about this or, but it's just a kind of a, again, it's all getting back to me sort of feeling, yeah, freed up or mm. something. How do you feel about your work being read as self-portraiture? Um, I think there's definitely an element of that there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in a way, like, it was a decision to kind of turn the camera onto myself 
and you know to turn the camera onto myself when I'm hitting a certain age as well like it's not like oh I'm all young and you know <laughs> so it's kind of like okay here we go let's 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 start revealing yeah certain things yeah so I guess it was an existential sort of psychological thing really but also I felt that it was kind of payback from documentary because I'd been filming people so much in my life and and kind of for work and for various things yeah it yeah look I think it does it has an element of it it's never purely that yeah. yeah and I like looking into that I think from documentary like I used to be you know when I was shooting a lot of observational documentary I was quite good at reading that on other people so it's kind of reading myself was just like <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that one where it's just like shot in my I did it before a significant birthday and it's like a just uh, a headshot basically of me drumming which is a just self portrait yeah and I play to the first song I ever learned to drum to so it's like a, a channeling of my former self. Yeah. What and that was, that was pretty song? out there. Um, Earth, Wind and Fire, Let's Groove. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've touched a little bit um, on your work life as a documentary maker, but I also discovered in the research that you <laughs> have been a producer on several Australian reality TV shows. Real Housewives of Melbourne. Girls got to make a money somehow. Yeah. <laughs> But it's an interesting, you know, it's a really interesting <laughs> fact and it's sort of not where I had no. kind of placed you in, in my mind. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could talk about how some of those experiences have informed any of your art making or, you know. Well, they must have, you know, everything affects everything, right? Like, I was thinking, there was one job which I never really talk about where I drove from Melbourne to Darwin in like a couple of days following a big massive truck got a speeding fine for going 170 <laughs> outside some small town. I, did, I was just trying to chase the truck. <laughs> we'd have to, like, I had an assistant. We'd drive, and then we'd drive out ahead of the truck, find a hill, put the cameras on, get the shot of the truck snaking through the landscape. Then we'd have to run back down to the car and chase the truck. Oh then God. we'd lose it. And then I was like, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> so wild. Yeah, so if you look at that... And then you look at me drumming underwater, then there's probably a similar element of intensity and intent. And endurance. Yes, yeah. in that. So, yeah, yeah, I think those certain jobs, yeah, definitely. But, you know, when, when there's kind of silly stuff like Real Housewives of Melbourne or, you know, I did Bondo Rescue. I did a lot of medical. I was kind of in hospitals doing kind of medical emergency and something called Miracle Hospital and... You know, which is all very educational and I'd always approach everything as an artist, like because people would be going, oh, so what show are you going on to next? And I'd go, I'm not, I'm going off to make an art project. Yeah, so it really was like means to an end for me, but it was an interesting, entertaining way of means to an end. There's a physical intensity that I guess can come with working in yeah. big commercial... Yeah, I'm always carrying things, TV like spaces. drums or cameras or, yeah. you know, like it's, you know, <laughs> I've always been sort of, you know, kind of out there... Yep. doing stuff yeah 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 I was off to the doctor going you can just check my heart because I'm planning to do this you know <laughs> um it's funny when you when I'm doing those you know when I was drumming in the plane the happiest clearest moment I can have yeah when I'm doing that stuff like I am just like I love it mm. yeah it's the it's the meditative place yeah I've heard that you when you're within your art making practice, you've got this really sort of spontaneous and improvisational sensibility to your work and that you often don't check out your sites before you go to them or you, or you won't do like a dry run. You're really just like... Yeah, that's it. Yeah. You know, you go and you begin. Yeah, and most of the time I just do it once as well. So I'm even like, even if I've been playing and for, for a minute I might have had a pause or been a bit something, you know, something's happened, I'll leave it there. So sometimes you can see the, if you really look closely, you might find some inaccuracy. Mm. And that's just being human to me. Yeah, yeah. so I, I quite like that kind of, yeah, just do it. It's like, yeah, pure improvisation. Like, yeah, just do it. Just, mm. oh, you're going to go to this place and, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll learn about it when I'm there, you know. 
I was a youth worker for years. I worked with at-risk mm. kids and I worked in Indigenous communities in Northern Territory. And so I've just, you know, I don't know, I'm just open to experience, you know. Yeah. I am a bit of a, you know, I don't know whether it's the right terminology these days, but one friend that I collaborate with calls me an explorer. So it's, it's kind of interesting. Like. Comfortable in chaos. Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, yeah. The archive is also something that mm. you visit a lot in your art making. Mm. You've drawn on footage that you've shot years ago. You've used family documents. Yeah. You once even recreated your childhood bedroom for a performance. I was wondering what it was that draws you to this archival material and how do you know when it's the right time to revisit them? Yeah, you've got to be patient about the time. Like, I think I had that drumming in my teenage bedroom idea. That had been, I think that had been sitting in my head for years. Like, wouldn't it be great to do something like that? Mm. And so when the opportunity came up, I just thought, oh, I can drum in my teenage bedroom. And yeah, again, it's like, what? Yeah, I don't know. It just comes when it, it does. I don't know. I'm a bit of a time traveller. I do, I do love, like, going back in time and looking at things. It's easier than forward for me. That's interesting. Yeah, it's not that I'm not thinking of forward. I don't, I'll, I'll be around for a, a bit longer yet, but it's just, yeah, there's something in the, in the history. There is history that shouldn't be forgotten and is really quite interesting and informs now mm. as well. Well, Tina Havelock Stevens. <laughs> We've reached our final question. Oh no, I was enjoying interview. the chat. Oh yes. <laughs> Although I'm getting a bit hungry, I've got to say. Yeah, it's time for lunch, it's time for lunch. <laughs> if you could have dinner with any artist from Newcastle Art Gallery's collection, who would it be and why? Okay, this is going to be like, oh right, okay. But I would have lunch. Is it lunch or is it dinner? You can okay. pick. I would have breakfast <laughs> with Roy Demestra. Tell me why. And I've written, I've, I've actually got a little note on my lap here which says ghost meat. Okay, so Roy Demestra, he died in 1968. He was considered a pioneer of modern Australian painting. Mm -hmm. He also studied at the conservatorium. And he was my great, great uncle. No way. Yeah. Oh, I think it's about five generations back or something like that. Amazing. And so I wish I could talk to him um, because he had a real mix of the visual and sound. He did paintings that you could whistle kind of thing. Oh. He was inspired by colour therapy. Um, he worked with a doctor who was doing treatment for shell-shocked soldiers and he did these rooms of colour to kind of treat them, I guess, to calm them down. And his whole thing about colour and music impacting the human psyche was really strong. It was a period of time in his life that he did these. Um, he was also gay and he took off. He, he got sick of Australia. He was like, oh, look, I'm not going to be able to function here. And he went and hung out with Francis Bacon in England and apparently taught him how to paint. Really? He also did these colour harmonising charts, which he sold at Grace Brothers. <laughs> He changed the spelling of his name because he didn't think it was a good kind of, didn't think he could flourish. So I did, yeah, I did works around him a couple of years ago. Mm. Yeah. What were the works? Uh, they were like um, the archival postcards, but I painted VU meters on them as an emotional gauge. Ah. You know, a VU meter off your stereo. So it's like, yeah, on red. The postcards came from his aunt's family, I think and they were all addressed to a place in Marrickville. I guess his family were probably pretty harsh on him and I think, you know, obviously being gay at that time wasn't, wasn't great. And, um, and then his whole sort of going to England and hanging out with Francis Bacon. I mean, what a wild guy he was. I mean, oh my God. <laughs> so yeah, he's, I would just like to talk to him yeah. and find out his kind of inner, inner stories and, mm. and about the family and yeah. I would enjoy that very much, yeah. That's a stunning answer. And you've now taught me something that I didn't know about our own collection. Yeah, That's Mr. Wonderful. Mr. Roy Demestra, yeah. What are you having for brekkie? 
Hey, what are you having for breakfast? With with um, great what uncle. What will you uh, be into? <laughs> I'm kind of pretty much vegetarian these days. I'm pescatarian, but he'd probably want bacon and eggs. Hey. <laughs> Tina, thank you so much for having us today. That's it's been okay. an absolute pleasure. <laughs> I've had an absolute riot. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for thanks for coming to the new, you know, yeah, the, the new, new place. Digs. Yeah, the new digs <laughs> indeed. Thank you for listening to Conversations from the Collection. If you'd like to know more about Tina and her work in Newcastle Art Gallery's collection, there are links in the show notes or you can visit the gallery's website at nag.org.au. Join us next week when we speak with Torres Strait Islander ceramicist Janet Fieldhouse. In the pottery community, everyone's influenced by everyone, so you have to change it. You have to make it new. You have to move forward. Conversations from the Collection is a Newcastle Art Gallery production and we pay our deepest respects to the traditional custodians of the lands on which this podcast was produced. This project is supported by the New South Wales Government through Create New South Wales. And if you enjoyed listening, please like, subscribe and share us with your friends.